I'd like you to turn to Acts chapter 8. I really want to talk about, continue talking about the, uh, the anointing of the Spirit. Okay, context here is that Philip, who's a very anointed evangelist, he goes down to Samaria, strange place for a Jew to go because they hated Samaritans and uh, Samaritans hated them and they had good reason to as well. But Jesus, remember, said after the Spirit had come, uh, they would be filled with his spirit anointed with power and they will become his witnesses, Judea, Samaria. Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria. May not mean much to us, it meant a load to them because it meant going into enemy territory. And uh, their persecution has taken place and the Apostle Paul, who was Saul in those days, is uh, uh, very much instrumental in, and he says, destroying the church. And so that's the context. People are in fear, fleeing for their lives, uh, becoming refugees, taking what possessions they had and fleeing to different parts uh, of Palestine, sometimes as far as 300 miles to get away, escape. And yet everywhere they went, they shared the gospel. Churches were planted. It was not the work of apostles. By and large, it was the work of grassroots Christians that were just sharing their faith. So it was a very, very exciting time. It was, it, was, uh, it was the sort of thing that you could not have predicted. But it was a work of sovereign work of God after the martyrdom of Stephen. And uh, here we have um, the account of Philip and the work um, that he does. And it says that on that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went, and Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many. Merry paralytics and cripples were healed, so there was great joy in that city. <clears throat> now, for some time, a, a man named Simon, who practiced sorcery in the city, uh, and an, uh, amazed all the people there, he boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magical arts. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. And when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Spirit. And just go to Acts chapter 19, just a couple of verses there. <clears throat> Here's Paul now coming to this great city of Ephesus, notorious for immorality, for sorcery, black magic, um, the, art, the worship of Artemis and all that went with that. And he's now come, clearly led of God. This is the time for this great city. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, well, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Well, Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance 
he told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. There were about 12 men in all. That means probably there's about 50. There were 12, 12 families there. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you uh, send him today in the same way that you sent him those 2,000 years ago. We pray that this word may do us good this morning. And Lord, it may do us good and that the result may be we will do this city and this nation and even the rest of the earth good because of what you do today. Amen. Amen. If you were with us yesterday, uh, some of you were as leaders, we looked at one of my favorite Old Testament characters, really a revivalist. Um, in the book of Judges, a guy named Shamgar, who took an ox goad and slew 600 Philistines. And you find in the Old Testament, there are these amazing stories of these, these very anointed men and women, women like Deborah takes a tent peg and knocks it in someone's sort of forehead and things like that. You know, this sort of stuff that people do. Don't, Liz, don't take any, you know. But, you know, the one, one, of, the, but one of the things you find in the Old Testament um, is that there aren't many anointed people. There's just a few. Just a few anointed people are special. They do special tasks. Some of them later sort of fall right away from God, and God has to withdraw his anointing from them. But right through the Old Testament, there's a promise. And it was a promise that perhaps we don't understand quite the seriousness of it, but if you'd been a Jew living then, and you'd seen these anointed guys and girls around, you might have thought, wow, wish I could have a bit of that. But they couldn't, because the time hadn't come. The Messiah had not come. He had not been offered up. He had not been raised from the dead. The Spirit had not come, but there was that promise right through the Scriptures that one day the Spirit will come, and all God's people will be anointed with the Spirit, will be filled with with the Holy Spirit, it's there, and um, um, and we know that that happened at Pentecost. The problem is, throughout the ages, when you look at the church, you just have to sometimes say, "Well, you know, well, somehow the church missed out somewhere." In fact, it's very possible you can be in the New Covenant but almost live an old covenant experience. And what, I'll explain that, that you, you obey the commandments, you live a righteous life, you, you are sanctified, and you're thrilled when some big named speaker or uh, miracle worker, man or woman comes to town, wow, the big guy or girl has come to town, now God's going to do something. Whereas actually in actual fact, God intended something else. So we can live in old covenant experience even as new covenant followers of God and if you go through the history of the church and you can trust me on this one and I can send you tapes and you can even see some films on this but the fact is the, the fact is this that the person who gets neglected more than anyone else in church history is the Holy Spirit and I asked the question as a student of church history why is that in the early church, it was mainly to do with the combating of heresy because the church was having to deal with so much heresy that it played safe. Make sure we got with sound in doctrine. And when you get sound in doctrine and you get defensive and you play it safe and, 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 and leaders become a little controlling, not because they want to control but because they want to protect. But the person who gets lost in it all is the Holy Spirit. It's not that he's not present. I'm not saying that. But he's not free to work in the way that he would. Now, I don't think heresy bothers us too much these days. One of my friends says, most of the church don't understand enough doctrine to get into heresy. So, 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 and they wouldn't recognize it when it came. Uh, and if that is true, that is sad. If that is true, then that's saying something that we've equally missed out somewhere else. Um, but I, I think today, when I look at today's church... And I, I, understand, I, I try to think, wh wh why is it sometimes we, we sort of neglect the spirit? Do you know what it is? I think it's success that does it. I think success. You see, churches grow. They get into the hundreds. Some we've got churches now getting beyond the thousand. So you can't have one service in a small, small building that only holds a couple of hundred. So you have five services. And now you have to get very structured. Time is very important to us. 
And so what happens is we squeeze some things out. And the thing we usually squeeze out is giving room for, for the Holy Spirit to operate and edify the body through the gifts that he gives to the body. Uh, and you know, then, we, then we miss out. And again, I'm saying it's not that the, it's not that the, the Spirit is, is, is absent. Of course he's present, but he's not there given the freedom that he would like to have. And uh, it's, 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 it's pretty clear from the Scriptures that when the Spirit came at Pentecost, he did not rest on a few. He did not come to anoint a few leaders. It wasn't Peter, James, John. It was the whole body. That's why Luke, is, he was such a great sort of historian. He would cause us. They were all in one place. They were all filled. The Spirit rested on all of them. And it, there was no exceptions. And, and so... The, We have to make sure that we, and this is the only way I can put it, because words are difficult to find. I believe we have to create the atmosphere where the Holy Spirit feels welcome and is able to come and do what he does. Now, you're learning something about that. And in this charismatic movement, which we're part of, we're, we're learning something of that. We've learned something already. We're now facing the challenges of growth, success, and how do we make sure we don't lose the Spirit? I want to take you back in history to a place called Topeka. It's near Kansas City. The year is 1898. And there's a guy there called William Parham. He's a Methodist minister. He's been brought up very much in the holiness tradition. He's a man who nearly died as a youngster and God raised him up. He promised God that he'd become a minister. But he he got disillusioned with the church. He went in and became a medical doctor and again was seriously ill. And, and really repenting of the fact that he'd not followed the call of God on his life, God raised him up again, and he then went into ministry, and he had a, he had a successful healing ministry. He'd, somehow faith had been gathered through these two you know, divine encounters, and he had this faith ministry, but he was also a disciple of others. And he, he used to take a bunch of boys and girls every year, about 40 in all, and it was the Old West uh, it, the, the gunslingers had gone, but the roads weren't made up. It was pretty raw in those days. A couple of bunk houses out the back, of 20 for the gals, 20 for the guys, near the twain shall meet. And he used to go on trips sometimes, and he'd leave them with little um, projects to do. One day, he said to them, while I'm away on this trip, I'm going to be away for three or four days, I want you to study the first chapters of the Acts of the Apostles. And when I come back, I, I, I want to hear what you think. And came back gathered them together, said, what do, we, you know, what, what do you think? And they said, well, you know, it seems to us, it seems to us that in those early days when the Spirit came on people, you know, they, they spoke in tongues and often prophesied, but something happened that was just different. And a young woman called Agnes Osman said, well, pray for me then that I might be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, Parham had not known anything of the Spirit in that way himself, but prayed for her and he said, wow, as he prayed for her, it was like a light came over her and she started to speak in Chinese dialect. In fact, she couldn't speak English for three days. That's quite amazing. It's all recorded. And then the others said, pray for me. So all 40 of them were prayed for and all 40 of them spoke in known languages. Now, I can't find historically another time in history that that, that, that's happened since Pentecost. I can't find one. I know of individuals that have done it. And then those people believed that that was a sign for them that they would actually go as missionaries to those parts of the world that they spoke those languages. And they actually did that. Amazing. It's it's amazing. And uh, you'd think the church would say, wow, wonderful, let's have some of this. But they didn't. Didn't like it. You know, didn't like that one. Doesn't fit in with, you know, the establishment and the way we do things and all the rest. There's probably a bit of wackiness about. I mean, you've got to have some wackiness somewhere. The spirit, when the spirit comes, it, it does turn things upside down and cause all sorts of problems, doesn't he? But they went and they were successful missionaries, and it was a mighty move of God came out of that. Parham was sort of ostracised, and he left and he, he got himself a big tent and went down to Kansas and until he died in 1927. He had these great crusades. I've reckoned something like two million came to Christ during those years and many, many healings took place. But there was a black man called um, 
William J. Seymour, who, who studied under him. He was there. Now, now, you've got to remember, in those days, because of the segregation laws, black and white did not sit together. It wasn't allowed. But, but Seymour was hungry for God. So he got a cardboard box, cut the eyes out and the mouth, put it on his head, and he sat in the meetings. You see, pretty humble sort of guy. And not surprisingly, the mantle came on him. And he then moved down to, uh, moved down to Los Angeles, and he started some meetings in a place called Bonnie Bray Street. Very, very Scottish, by the way, you can imagine. So they were all Scots down there. And they had these meetings. He'd not been filled with the Spirit or anything like that, but they believed there was something more. I believe there was something more. And then God broke out and there was healings. There was people baptized in the Spirit. They said sometimes the meetings went, went on for hours. They were so noisy. Other times it was just quietness, just a sense of the stillness of God. But God was doing things. Great testimonies came out of it. The porch became a pulpit. You know, the way the Americans have these great big, they call it something else, they don't call it a porch, do they? And, and eventually it collapsed. So they had to find a building, and they found an old Methodist building that was used for storage. It had been partly burnt down in a place called Azusa Street. And that was the beginning of the great Azusa Street. But for three years, people came from around the world, from this part of the world. Um, and, and there was a great outpouring of the Spirit, which was to have amazing effect. And really, the beginnings of the, what we would call the Pentecostal stroke charismatic renewal were still in the history of that Really, that's where it all begins. But you know, what happened was that there was a woman there called Jenny Evans Moore who played the piano and had amazing encounters with God. And um, W.J. Seymour fell in love with her. That upset one of the other ladies who really thought that she had had a word that she should be marrying him. And in spite, she destroyed all their records and everything. And after three years, the revival came to an end because the Holy Spirit was grieved and he left. And it was such a sad ending to what was a mighty move of God. So we have to be, it's a delicate thing when God turns up. I tell you folks, it's a very delicate thing and we do not want to grieve him and we do not want to quench him. And, but we need to learn how again to, uh, we need the spirit again. And you know, we might think, wow, it's good now. Well, there's better to come. So let's just come back to the text for a moment because here we see scattered Christians are sharing the word everywhere they go. I don't know why they call this the Acts of the Apostles because it doesn't much to do with apostles. It's to do, I love it, it's to do with grassroots Christian people who obviously got something of God in them, some understanding of doctrine, theology, uh, zeal, passion, the Holy Spirit, and then wherever they went, it happened and churches were planted mainly amongst Jewish communities or um, those who uh, were converted to Judaism. But Philip went down to Samaria. He was a very anointed, like a Shamgar or a Gideon in the Old Testament, very anointed evangelist. And what was the outcome? The outcome was that there were miracles, signs and wonders, healings, lots of demonic deliverance, and great salvation came to the city. Now, is that good? Is that good? Come on, come on. Is it good? Is it good? Is it great? No, it's not. No, it's not great. It's okay. No, it's not great. I'll tell you why it's not great. You see, the apostles understood what God really wanted to do. Because you see, having one anointed servant come and do all his stuff is good. But you see... Peter and John and the other apostles understood that God wanted more than that. Paul understood that. And so it says that they went down there because they had seen the Spirit on one man and they had been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, but as yet the Holy Spirit had not fallen on them. What does that mean? Well, it means basically they'd not be filled with the Holy Spirit, not be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not receive Spirit. They were born again, were they? Of course they were born again. They were baptized. They were regenerated by the Spirit. There's different works to the Spirit. The evangelical church for years denied that. Ridiculously. It's not an issue of doctrine. This is an issue of urgency. And so Peter and John go there. 
and lay hands on them so they all receive the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, the filling of the Spirit. Why? So that it's though the city doesn't rely on one anointed fellow when he turns up every few years. But now we have a Spirit-filled community. Same with Paul. Paul goes down to Ephesus. Paul is probably the greatest anointed apostle of all time. I mean, when you read him, you think, oh, he's a terrible model for an apostle. <laughs> Who wants to be anything like an apostle when you've got Paul as a model? Yeah. But do you know what? Paul realized this. This is God's time for this city, but I can't do the job on my own. I need an anointed community, a spirit-anointed community. So Paul, when he arrives there, he he says, did you receive the Spirit? He knew they hadn't received the Spirit. Now, some people say, well, they weren't Christians, were they? They were Christians, because Luke calls them disciples. He don't call anybody disciples unless they were Christians. It's a technical term for Luke. Now, they weren't fully orbed, but how many of us were fully orbed? You know, I was saved at 19. I had to wait a couple of years before I was baptized. But nobody ever taught it. Nobody ever, I didn't hear about it. So I wasn't fully orbed. I wasn't even baptized till, in water till later than that. So you can't say a cop out way where they weren't saved. Of course they were saved. They were baptized again. Of course they were. But so was everybody else that had John's baptism. So they now, what's he got? He's got a spirit filled community. Probably about 12 families. And Paul thinks right now, a city of 240,000, now we're going to take it on for Christ. Uh, a daunting task, but within three years, less than three years, they were right because these Christians had turned this city upside down. Their, their economy was threatened because of the gospel, as well as a load of other things. So we've got here now spirit-filled communities. This spirit-filled community that went out from Jerusalem within 30 years, the gospel had gone as far as Rome. That was an amazing achievement. We need spirit-filled communities. We want anointed preachers and teachers. We want the big boys and girls where they can come around. Yet God still does that, but he wants us to be new covenant in our experience, not old covenant. That means for every one of us, he wants us to be anointed with the spirit. So let's look at just briefly the outcome of this spirit-filled community. Well, it says this in the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, Something. This guy Theophilus, don't know who he was. Some people think he was a judge that was going to judge Paul at Rome. My lawyer background, I quite like that. Because it does read as a sort of a, an apology. It reads as a defense of Christianity. And uh, he writes to Theophilus and he says, you know, my former book I wrote to you. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. So Jesus did two things. He taught and he did. Two things. That sums up his ministry pretty well. So you read the Gospels think, it's all that Jesus did, that which was practical, was, was there on the ground, visible, could be seen, and he taught. He educated people at the, same, at the same time with the kingdom of God. And so as I understand from that, we are to do and to teach. So as the Western church, since the Reformation, we've been more teaching than we've been doing. And this is why God has to send the Spirit because the Spirit helps us do things. <laughs> and, we, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but I love, I love the, the academia. I love the wealth of, of intellectualism. I love us reading, reading this morning stuff that you would probably, you wouldn't die for. Um, but I was reading Augustine of Hippo in the 4th century and his doctrine of the Trinity, and I read all this stuff. This is wonderful. I want to get hold of this. You know why? Because there are people who ask me, you've got three gods, haven't you? You're more polytheistic, aren't you? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, explain that to me. I can do that because I've read it, I've studied it. It's important that I know that. So the, 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 the learning side of our faith is absolutely vital. But, you know, the bit we've tended to neglect is the, is, the, is, is the doing side. And the Western church is catching up on that. That's why there's these moves of the Spirit in the Western church uh, so, uh, so much. And so we find that uh, the, the ministry of Jesus 
was one of miracles, signs and wonders, healing, loads of compassion, lots of words for people. It was, it was, it was tremendous. Um, well, how's it worked for us? Well, it works for us because we go to the Word and uh, we have to go to the Word. I can't trust any other re- source reliably other than what is in the Word or backs up from the Word. So I'm a Word man. Don't get me wrong this morning. You know where I'm coming from. But Jesus said to the disciples, he said, um, by the way, I've got some good news for you. I'm going. That wouldn't have sounded good news to me. And uh, he said, I'll tell you why I'm going. Because uh, if I don't go, the other guy can't come. Well, who's the other one? The spirit of truth that the Father will send. Okay. So Jesus explains, I am limited in my ministry. I'm going to have a bigger ministry than this. This is just the beginning. I have one body, and that body is like your body. I've been incarnated. But this body has limitations. But I'm going to have another body. No limitations. Limitations off. When the Spirit comes. That's why today there are 100 million or more charismatic Christians in China. That is why out of China and other places are coming. Amazing testimonies. Because they are spirit-filled communities. Ever get a chance of picking up of Arthur Wallace's little book called China Miracle? The second part, he was smuggled into China. And, and you know, Arthur was never an over-the-top army, arm, arm, army, uh, army guy, major in the army. They, those guys aren't over the top. But he records there for us to encourage us and build our faith. The mighty works that Jesus was doing through a spirit-filled community. You see, so this is how it works. Jesus said, you're going to do the works. Well, they said, well, who's going to do the works? Oh, we, we, we haven't got any Elijahs. We haven't got any uh, Shamgars. He said, anyone who has faith will do the works that I do. Anybody here? Anybody, who's, has anybody not got faith here? Well, you wouldn't know enough anyway, sensibly, because you get the gospel, wouldn't you? But we've we got faith. We're people of faith here this morning, aren't we? Yeah, aren't we? Of course we are. How much faith have you got? Far too much. That's good news. Anybody got less too much? I sometimes think, Lord, I'm like the disciples. Lord, give me some more faith. But you see, Jesus talked about mustard seeds and things like that. So we're not talking about a lot of faith. We're just talking about anyone who has faith in me will do the works that I did. What did he do? He turned water into wine. That's a good one. Raise the dead, that's not bad. Cleanse the lepers, lepers. that's good. Yep, bread, yeah. He showed mercy, he showed compassion. He brought words of comfort. You know, he did lots of things. You know, John says if he wrote about all Jesus did, would be the kingdom come. So he said, you're going to do this. And even more will you do, greater works, because I'm going to the Father. In other words, what he was saying was this. I'm going to have a multi-membered body, anointed with the Spirit, spirit Spirit-filled communities. The sum total of what they will do will be an amazing demonstration to people. The kingdom has already come, although it's going to come in greater measure, measure later. So this is how it works. This is how it works in practical terms. Tomorrow, you're going to go out into the community. It's, it's, it's nice being here with friends. It's nice to worship. But when you get out there, it's a little bit scarier, yes? Yeah. Yes. Don't feel quite so bold and so powerful and so faith-filled. But, you know, it's, it's like that out there. And, yeah, then that's where Jesus said you're going to go. That's, what, that's the purpose of it, actually, to equip us to go out. So tomorrow you're going to go out. You're going to meet people. And, you know, although people are British, and, of course, you're meeting Scottish, Scottish people. I know there is a difference. Oh, I get reminded every time I come to this place. That's okay, it's okay. Okay, as long as I still watch Man United, I really don't mind. But this is what it's going to work. What do you do? Oh, yeah, you're an engineer, right. Well, tomorrow, you may go into the office or the site or wherever you do. You may meet a colleague and you might say to your colleague, how you doing? Do you have a good weekend? Well, I have bad news this weekend. My, my wife's been diagnosed with cancer. And what's going to happen is down here, in your gut, you're going to feel something. The Bible calls it mercy. It move with compassion. The Jews called it, um, um, it was like a bowel movement in the, your bowels of mercy. It was, it was, it's a movement. It's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit here 
is saying to you, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Whether it's the answer to be healed or just to be prepared for death or whether it's to show a lot of comfort or mercy. Now what's got to happen is this. What happens down here has got to travel up to here and come out with, with, with words. Not articulate words, but just words that show the love of Jesus. Trouble is, for Western Christians, we think about all this. So it actually it gets up through there, up into here. Yeah. And we think, and we lose it, don't we? Yeah. Uh, that's called quenching the Holy Spirit. Our intellects are subject to our spirits, not the other way around. We need both. We need to be moved by the Spirit. So we get moved, we get moved by the Spirit. I, 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 sh- I shared this many, many years ago. Um, um, and um, this story, I said, you know, first thing builders do when they go on a job is drink tea. Well, it's true. In England, they do anyway. <clears throat> and um, then they get chatting. I said, you're chatting to this lady, and she tells you that she's got a lump on her breast, and they've diagnosed it as a tumor, and it's malignant, etc. and she's very fearful. I said, now, what, what's got to come out of your mouth is something like, oh, look, can, can, can I just talk to you about my faith? We've got a group at church that could pray for you and, uh, and I, I went through that sort of scenario and then a couple of weeks later the, the guy who was the drummer at this celebration I was uh, preaching at his name was Paul and he said to me he said Ray you're never going to believe this but I'm a builder and the next day the very thing you said happened to me and he I said did you talk he said oh he said, he said yeah I mean you put the fear of God into me he said I I uh, I, I just said well, well look, well, look well, can, can we help you can we come to the hospital can, can we look after your kids and, and, and he said, you know, that we've now made contact with them and we're doing what we can. And I never heard anymore until about two years ago. I was at a, uh, getting on a plane at Gatwick and I saw this guy and he, he looked very overweight. And I thought, that's Paul. And I saw him look at me thinking, is that Ray Lowe? No, it can't be. He's very overweight. <laughs> uh, and um, eventually I, we met up and he said, it's Ray. I said, it's Paul. I said, whatever happened to that couple? He said, they came through. She came to the Lord. The kids are in the church now, grown up. So it was wonderful. Now, I don't know whether it was surgery, whether it was chemo, whether it was... Go- I believe God's in everything, to be honest, folks. Yeah. I mean, you know, I thank God for me- medicine and all the research. The, the skills that God gives to men and women, if they use godly, they, they praise God. I don't, don't mind. It doesn't really matter. But I thought, yeah. You see, God wants us to be sensitive to his promptings, folks. How many of us... How many of us every day, um, somebody comes into our mind and we neglect it? Some years ago, uh, probably about 15 years ago now, I, I had an experience which, which has changed me. I, was, I, was re- I felt God speak to me about a friend I hadn't seen for 25 years. His name was Ron. We used to play soccer together, went on holiday together. A Christian guy, when the charismatic thing broke, he couldn't hack it. And he went off and he f- never went to church after that, went into doing good works. He was into theatre, so he did a lot of charitable work, particularly cancer research. I felt I, I should phone him. And I thought, right, well, I'll find out where he lives, and I phoned him. And as I phoned him, it was the evening, I said, it's Ray Lowe, Ron. He, I, I said, he said, Ray, you're not going to believe this. He said, he said, Irene is dying tonight. I said, Irene, that's his wife, lovely lady. She's dying tonight. And I'm just going to the hospital. He said, I haven't prayed for 20 odd years. He said, he said, I've just said to God, he said, I, I, I tried to read my Gideon Bible, he said, I just chucked it across the room. And I said to God, if you really cared, you'd send someone. He said, the phone's rung. So I went, I was with them both, with, with them when she died, was able to bring them back into peace, re- restore them. And then uh, several years later, I was able to marry Ron to another lovely Christian lady. They're living out in France, a little Christian uh, church community out there now. But it was a little prompting of the Spirit. I had one the other day. So I made a phone call. It was just a chat, but it didn't matter. Didn't matter. God, God wants us to be sensitive to his spirit. You see, the problem is with charismatic Christians, we can think it's for meetings only. Here, how often, how much time do you spend in the meeting? I'm going to spend a bit more time this morning. But I, I, if we don't live in meetings, we live in the world. Jesus said, Father, don't take them out of the world. Keep them from the evil one. And so we're, we are here to, to be doers to, to, and, and to be open, to be prompted. Every day, as part of my daily bread, I say, God, I'm available today. You want to prompt me? I'll get on a plane, I'll get on a train, get on whatever. I'm, I'm available. That's how we are to live. And the second thing here is that Paul, that he 
taking on this great city, he, t- he rents a facility from a guy called Tyrannus because he wants to teach Christians. He wants to teach them doctrine. He wants them to be sound in theology. The outcome of that two and a quarter years is this. He never leaves the city, but those he trains go out and they plant all the ch- churches in the area called the Roman province of Asia. Amazing church planting comes because yeah, there's a doing and there's a learning. And folks, I want to be a man of the word and the spirit. I want The two have got to gel together, okay? This is so important because what we'll end up with is word-centered churches or spirit-centered churches. The one will be wacky and the other will be dry. And what we want, we want is spirit-filled churches where we, 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 we understand because God's given us minds and intellects. We grapple with some of these issues. Not all of us are going to be the same on this. Phil, you've got a good mind. And it needs to be fully trained so that you can serve and raise up. Perhaps we need the, we need the both. Paul understood that. He was a man of the spirit. But he was also a man of the word, and to be honest, if we're men of the word without the spirit, it won't do what it should do, and it won't speak to us in the way that it ought to. Now, I'm just going to finish with this one thing. Paul, six years after being in Ephesus, turned the city upside down. Some people say as many as 80,000 were saved in that city, one third. Now, it's difficult to verify these statistics, and not everybody goes along with that, but I like, I like the sound of that. I can believe for that. But he writes six years later, and he says to these, these um, Christians that were filled with the Spirit, he says, keep on being filled with the Spirit. Now, the frustrating thing for me is he don't tell us how. And the reason he doesn't, because they knew, but we need to know. I, I just want to share with you this thing about being filled with the Spirit, being continually filled with the Spirit. How do we do it? Um, this is how I do it, okay? I said to Andy this morning, he can correct this if he likes, after I go, but it works for me, so there you go. Um, the first thing is, it's five things basically. First thing is, I believe this is God's will for my life. I believe it's the norm. It's normality, Christian. It's not got to do with feelings. It's not got to do with feelings. I love the feelings. I love the sensations. You know, wobble shakes, umpty dumpties. I'm all for that. You know, bring it on. Let's have as much a sort of feeling and experience as we can. But life's not like that when you go to work on Monday morning. But on Monday morning or Tuesday morning, whenever, I believe I'm filled with the Spirit. It's, it's my norm as a Christian. I don't need feelings. But what it means is this, I'm ready when God opens up something for me. Secondly, I make sure there are no hindrances that quench or grieve the Holy Spirit. What grieves and quenches the Holy Spirit more than anything else? Sin, you're right. Okay? If you don't believe me, ask Tiger Woods. He has not performed till last week on a golf course, greatest golfer in the world. He's not performed since the time his sin was exposed and he came into disgrace and shame and all the rest. Why is it you cannot perform at the top level in anything when you have a bad conscience. If it's true in the carnal world, how true it is in the spiritual. If I am in sin, you know, you can go through the motions. You might even get away with it for a while. You know, just go through recent history in America, some of the healers. Got away with it for a while, not for long. We've got to keep ourselves free from sin. I'm going to say some things now that, I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm a man. You know, don't be fooled by this body. There's still life in it, believe you me. (laughs) I find the whole sexual thing uh, pretty appealing. Good-looking chicks without their clothes on. I find I'm tempted by all that. And is there a man that isn't here? No. God made us to respond. I'm going home tomorrow. I shall respond. I won't even have to think about it. It will happen because God made me that way. He made me that way for procuration, for unity in marriage, and for enjoyment of one another. But I travel. Sometimes I'm on my own. And uh, I have hotel rooms. 
Sometimes I stay in nice hotel rooms where all the, all the rotten stuff is free. Yeah. And I, I get tempted. And you might be saying, well, Raylo, you're a weak man. You're right, I am a weak man. That's the whole point of this. Jesus was tempted, I'm told, just like I am. Or I'm tempted like he was. Okay, do you believe that? If you don't believe that, then incarnation doesn't help us one iota. One iota. But I'm born again, so I have the ability now not to be tempted to sin, whereas I once was. I can make a choice. So when I'm in a hotel room for a week and all this stuff is there, I phone my wife every evening and I chat with her on the phone. I did that in Missoula some time ago. It cost me 500 pounds in phone calls. And one of my friends said, you must be mad. I said, no, no, I'm smart. Because I'm just on my way to Mexico and I've got to go in the power of the Spirit. And I know if I mess up, I've got a bad conscience. The best I can do is put on a show. And I don't want to put on a show. I want to live for God in the power of the Spirit and be, a, and be a healthy man at the same time. I never go to bed without my wife. We have an agreement. I don't stay up and flick through channels. Some of you do. And you know what it's like. You, know, you don't need to go looking for it. It'll come looking for you because we have an enemy who knows just what, we, just what we want to see. Now, for you girls, it's different, I know. Although it's not so different as it used to be, I'm told. Okay. I'm speaking very seriously because you, you are a serious church here and you expect to do great things for God, but you won't do it unless you get through this one. Okay, guys? I'm serious on this. So my wife wants to go to bed. I go to bed and read. And we talk about it. And, you know, we're so open about this. Do you know why? Because I hate sin. And I hate what it does to me if I give way to it. Because I want to be on top. For, I want to perform at the top level for God. I am concerned about performance. Not, not for me, but for, for, for the kingdom. So sin, we just can't have anything to do. And, you know, if we sin, not when, the scripture says, if we do, we have an advocate with the Father. And boy, oh boy, do we get to him quickly. Yeah. We keep... Quick accounts, short accounts. So I do that. I make sure. Every day I pray, God, keep, keep changing me. And you know what? Thirdly, I believe it's my daily bread. Jesus said, ask for your daily bread. So I ask him, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit again okay, today. And then what do I do? I just go and live. I get on with life. I don't think, now what do I do today? What's the first thing? Oh, my goodness. See, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit and, and you thought, oh my goodness, how am I going to fit all this in? It's a wretched woman at Samaria I'm going to meet. And we're not going to have lunch either. I mean, what do we do? And then on the way, there's all this, oh my goodness. He was so stressed out, wasn't he? No, no. he wasn't. We're not meant to be stressed out. We're meant, to be, we're meant to live by the Spirit. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying that's the way we're meant to live. And then lastly, I use tongues a lot. Not just in kissing. <laughs> well, some of who I know, who was it was asked that? The non charismatic great speaker was asked, Do you use tongues? He said, Only when kissing. <laughs> oh, I, well, I, I, I speak in tongues. And I speak in tongues a lot. Why? Because it's a wonderful gift to build me up. And I'm a weak and needy man like David. And we need to get with charismatics and we don't speak in tongues anymore. We're mad. Yeah. I mean it. That's why it's so nice to come into your meetings, you sing, sing in the spirit. I tell you what, folks. The greatest danger that we'll have is sophistication. We'll lose the rawness of this work of the spirit. So I want to encourage you. Don't let anyone rob you. And even this church grows and gets bigger... Paul says, whenever you come together, we make room for the Holy Spirit. This church is only as good as your devotional life. We're charismatics. We can come. We can dance. We can sing. We can raise our hands. We can speak in tongues. Once you've got the gift, you're not going to lose it. We, we can put on a good show, can't we? We're charismatics. Blimey, if we can't, who can? This church is only as good as your intimate relationship with Jesus. But if you develop that, boy, there is no, there's no 
end to what you can achieve for Jesus. And with that, I've finished really, except this. I want to anoint people with oil this morning who feel they want that. Oil is nothing more than a symbol. But if you receive what's symbolic by faith, then God does something. Like the laying on our hands. I was in a meeting in St. Petersburg a week or two ago and I was preaching uh, in, a, in a hotel. I shouldn't have been preaching there. And uh, a guy came in and they didn't like the look of him. He was uh, dressed in a three-piece suit, looking very smart. They thought he was KGB or the equivalent. So they marched him out quick. And uh, eventually they brought him in. And I kept speaking and I was speaking on the spirit. And I said, I'd like to anoint some people with oil this morning. I think God spoke to me about doing that. Or well, this evening. Hands up if you want it. This guy put his hand up. First guy. I didn't know he was. Afterwards I found he was a guest in the hotel. Heard some singing. He was a, he was a Russian Orthodox. And that night he got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Isn't that good? That's a good one, isn't it? Hey, it's good. I'm going to milk that one for a long, <laughs> long, long time. I do like those sort of stories. So folks, if you want to be anointed with oil, receive that as a symbol. Who likes wine? I'm glad about that. I only like good wine. Um, But it says this, Psalm 104. Listen, 104, it says this. He's given me wine that gladdens the heart of man, and he's given me oil to make my face shine. He wants shiny faces in Glasgow. And if we don't have the oil, we will not shine for him. So I want to anoint you. This morning, if you want it with faith, um, the others are going to, you're going to have to help now, you can, you see now. You're allowed now, you've been ordained bishop of the church, you're now allowed to baptise and, or to, and oil, so we're going to do it, and we're going to, whatever, then we're going to have lunch, okay? The more important thing is the anointing, not lunch, by the way. You can have lunch any time, okay? Father, thank you for everything that this morning has meant to us. We believe it's meant something in heaven as well. And Lord, now we're going we're gonna to anoint one another well. And we pray, Holy Spirit, please come and own everything. We don't want just an anointed new elder. We want an anointed community. All of us, Lord, anointed to do and to speak in Jesus' name. Amen.